Welcome to Engage, Smart Sheets Conference here in Seattle, Washington. I'm Dave Nicholson with 6.5 Media on the road, and I've got a very special guest. We are going to be talking about all things related to innovation. Ferret Guard, president of not only product, but innovation. innovation. <laughs> Welcome. Good to Thanks, see you. Dude. So yeah. I, I want, I, I'd, I'd like to get your kind of philosophy and perspective on, on how you stay ahead of disruptors in an industry to make sure that your customers are delighted. And then how do you see past where things are today to innovate? Let's, let's start with that. What's yeah. your overall philosophy? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question, David. I think the, the way you should think about it is ultimately innovation is for people for our customers, right? And so you have to stay very focused on our customers and what, what they are trying to achieve and what do they therefore need for that. And often you find technology organizations get sort of fall in love with technology, right? Technology exists to serve human beings, our customers, right? And so, so, we, and so one of my big pieces of philosophy is let's stay focused on our customers. Let's focus on what are they trying to achieve, and therefore what tools and technology we bring to bear to help them make that happen. Um, and you know, I love technology. I mean, I'm a technologist, so, um, so when, when disruption happens, when you know, cloud computing happened last decade, or when we see generative AI come into, I do backflips in my head, uh, because those are opportunities to leverage technology to solve even more customer problems, right? And do them faster, make their experiences better. And so you, it's sort of this convergence thing, right? Like you, you take technology, but ultimately the point is, what is the value you are actually creating for our customers, right? So, so you're talking about empowering people instead of replacing them? Would that be, would that be fair to say? Absolutely, that is what it is about. So I'd, mm. like to dis, I'd like to disassociate myself from those thoughts just in case the AI in the sky <laughs> is looking at that with skepticism. <laughs> How do you, um, yeah. let's kind of double click on that. How do, you, how do you do that? How do you foster innovation with customer feedback? And, and really the other side of the equation is how do you do that internally? How do you incent people at Smartsheet to open themselves up to contribute to the innovation process? Yeah. You do. Yeah, I think, I think very interesting things to look at from both sides. So let's, let's look from a customer standpoint, right? So I'll give you a very concrete example so it actually makes it very real for you. So when we look at our customers, you know, Smartsheet is all about business users, empowering business users, because they are the closest to the organization's mission and whatever problems that organization is trying to solve, right? Um, I, often, I, I often sort of talk about the reason I'm at Smartsheet is because I read this book several years ago uh, called Sapiens, and one of the things the book talked about is that we as human beings, one of the things that, that makes us unique is how we band together to go pursue a mission. That's what an organization is. That's what a team is, right? Yeah. And Smartsheet's entire mission is to help all these missions, right? So, so it's like, what a place to be from a technologist perspective to go help all the missions of organizations out there. And so, so we, we take that very seriously. An example of that would be business users using Smartsheet trying to drive a project or a program, right? And but to be able to drive a program of hundreds of thousands of projects happening around the globe, they need to be able to build reports, they need to be able to build dashboards to share with their executives. And that requires doing formula calculations or doing data analysis. So, you know, when generative AI really sort of came into the forefront and after four decades of maturation, like, we get super excited because, like, nobody wants to write formulas, right? That, that's not that's not what an average business user wants to spend their time doing. But you need to do that to be able to present the right information aggregated at the right level. And so now we added the capability into our experience where you can just, in natural language, ask, I want to compute this value, right? I want to compute risk, or I want to compute budget. And we generate the formula for them. It's like thousands of hours saved and reduction of cognitive load, right? Same thing with analyzing data, right? Nobody wants to be a data scientist. An average business is not waking up every morning wanting to be a data scientist. So now they can just ask a question, tell me all my projects at risk organized by region, and we'll generate the dashboard for them. So such powerful things for our users. So that's customer. 
you asked the question also about the team, right? Yes. And so one of the things we do at Smartsheet is called Hack the Sheet. Right? It's our annual hackathon. And, and you know, engineers uh, are always looking to solve problems. They're, like, good engineers are wired to go find you know, gnarly problems and go work at that. And so creating a, uh, once a year, we have a one-week hackathon. And basically, it's a very organic process in the organization. Teams come up with like, problems they want to go solve, and they literally create these projects and organically teams form around those things. And they work on those things like for four days. And on Friday, we have what we call a demo day. All right? And, and they, like we, this year, we had like 70 demos, five minute demos. You can imagine, like Mark, myself, we spend the whole day watching these demos. What an energizing thing, right? The, the empowerment our engineers feel. And then when those projects get picked, we give them out awards in that, right? And those awards are mostly just a recognition of some amazing work they've done. And then when they take those and make them production ready, that's when the real realization happens, right? Two of the things that launched, that got announced at Keynote today, came right out of our hackathon. Oh, that's fantastic. Right? So, so that's, I mean, so it's, it's that value realization that they're feeling like they're having an impact, right? So hopefully that gives you both oh, yeah. from a customer lens yeah. and a, yeah. So, so on, the, on, the, on the team side of things, how do you guide folks to focus on things? You, you, you use the phrase solving problems. The assumption is if you solve customer problems, if you solve business problems, you do two things. You solve those problems and then you continue the smart sheet success in the market, right? Right. Um, sometimes engineers are fascinated and enamored by what they can do what can be done. How do, you, how do you rein that in? Do you, as part of your innovation hackathon, hack, hack the sheet hack process, the sheet, yeah. um, do you guide them to say, look, <laughs> don't tell me what you can do. Don't show me something that's cool for cool sake. You must, do you tell them they must map it to a customer need? Or are you looking at kind of both of them as possibly sparks for ideas? So in a year of <laughs> 52 weeks, right? 51 weeks they spend focusing on customer problems, right? We come up with listening to our customers, a product roadmap, okay. and where, right? That one week, we actually don't put any rules, and, and by design, right? But what you find is pretty incredible, right? You know, we are human beings, right? Like, we, we are engrossed in solving customer problems. Like, the way our product development process works, David, is like, everything starts with the customer problem definition. We call it a CPD. Right, uh, so there's a document written by the product managers on what the customer problem definition is, and we have real customer quotes in those uh, in those documents to energize the team. It's like we're solving real problems for our real customers, right? So, so the re reality of our engineers are deeply embedded in customer problems, right? Okay. And so, even though we don't put any rules, a lot of problems they solve are customer problems. That's why two of the things we released. To, uh, announced today were things that they actually built during Hackathon. At the same time, they also live as engineering teams, right? The, the development process, the testing process, the you know, production scale. So they see other problems which ultimately impact our customers, right? It may impact us in terms of velocity at which we are able to get things done. So, so teams pick whatever they want to pick, but what we learn is um, they are either solving customer problems or they're solving their own problems so that they can improve their productivity. And, and we love both of those things, right? Like, why would we not want engineers solving problems that makes them uh, produce things faster for our customers, right? And so, so, yeah, we don't put any rules on that, but okay. it's been incredible over the, my five and a half years here. Uh, this year was the sixth hackathon, uh, Hack the Sheet we did. And every year, I'm just blown away uh, by the innovation that comes out of the team, right? Like, and this year, like, our ha about half of them were generally AI-based uh, so projects. Next question. And, yeah. And you think that you know, I gave you examples. That, like some of those, some of the places they're using generative AI is just mind-bogglingly beautiful, right? Like using embedded models in the browser to speed up the experience of the customer, right? So all the way from using large language models in the cloud and doing that, right? So we see, we see all of that. So there's a sense when you talk about AI that we're kind of 
thankfully out of the terrified fear of missing out stage in AI where CIOs and C CTOs felt compelled to run in one direction. And that direction was, apparently I need to buy a bunch of NVIDIA GPUs. I'm not sure why, but apparently I need to, I need to go out and do that, otherwise I'm going to fall behind. I believe that we're in this more rational, reasonable period of time, but are you seeing, um, are you seeing customers desperate for AI enhancements for the sake of AI enhancements, or, or do you think that your customers are in a place now where they're looking at this more pragmatically in terms of saying, no, no, solve, I don't care about AI unless it solves a business problem. Are we, are we at that, are we at that yeah. insane yeah. point yet? Is it, so I would say I think customers are very much, a vast majority of our customers are very much in this, hey, what pragmatic business problem is AI going to solve for me, right? I would almost say that there is a certain amount of uh, fear and uncertainty because you know the technology is somewhat magical, right? <laughs> the analogy I like to use is, it's like the 1990s, right? Internet had just come out and people say, I would never buy anything on the internet. Like, right. I, would, I can't imagine banking on the internet. <laughs> so, so, you know, the generative AI is similarly fairly magical, right? Even though it's based on the same principles of statistics and probability and, right? Uh, but people don't understand it, right? So there's, I think we're, there's still a lot of learning and uh, trust building that is happening, right? The people who worry about the NVIDIA chips, and uh, they're probably much more the uh, cloud infrastructure players and sort of those guys, and, and they should be, because that's sort of where all the compute capacity is gonna come from, and right, to be able to go solve these problems in, with incredible um, elegance. So I'm, I'm looking forward to how that plays out. I think we are finding customers, and the way we are using generative AI in the product is all about, like the example I gave you, build your formulas. You don't have to apply your, like it can, software can do it for you or analyze your data and build your charts and graphs because it's very pragmatic, right? It's, it sort of saves me hundreds of hours, right? We estimated, we launched these four capabilities over the last year and we've estimated we've saved a million hours for our users, right? That they would have had to go do. So, so it's, that's sort of where it really becomes real for a lot of our customers. Yeah, a lot of attention. Um, I, I come from a background where I was very much embedded in the hardware space going back many decades. I was born in 1990, so I don't know what you're talking about when it comes to the internet thing. <laughs> uh, but, but I go back to kind of this knuckle-dragging hardware mentality. And so I've been, it's been refreshing to see a, a focus on hardware lately, yeah. frankly. <laughs> but you guys are really at the tip of the spear when it comes to legitimate uh, ROI. Being and able, user experience, Being able to yeah. demonstrate. You, you mentioned um, categorizing this in terms of or, you know, having the metric of hours saved and productivity. Um, what are some other ways that you see that manifesting itself? How do you, uh, you, you can say a million hours saved. That's a bit of an abstraction over an organization. But from an individual's perspective, how do you quantify how much more productive you can make an individual? Is it about... One individual can do the work of two, or is it one individual is now going to be doing higher level tasks? What, is, what does it look like? What, what's sort of the future of work you, it, w with Smartsheet empowering users yeah. with a little bit of AI spice added to the mix? Yeah, I, and I may be um, sort of you know, controversial in that sense, so let me sort of say, I'm not convinced that, oh, one person being able to do two people's work is necessarily the only way to think about productivity, right? I think doing higher level work where we're taking the tedious, the tedious work out of your life is, there's a lot of value to that, right? I think there's value to sort of saying, oh, well, I sp spend fewer hours working, but I'm doing more thinking and I'm imagining a better place for, uh, for us, right? As, uh, I think humans are great at that level of creativity and imagination and like, so allowing humans to do what humans are brilliant at, while machines can do the things, the lot of the tedious work, right? It just makes us happier, more productive, right? If we can have some, uh, some hours saved where we can sit and be entertained, that may not be a bad thing, right, Dave? If this thing actually succeeds, many things play out, right? We'll see productivity gains, we'll see tedious work 
um, being done by the, we'll see humans being able to potentially work less, right, and still make the same level of sort of, and probably better uh, quality of life, right? So I think we'll see many of those things play out. Final bonus question for you, PG. If you had to tell me something that most people would find surprising about the process of driving innovation that you've learned in your many years presiding over fostering and cultivating innovation, what would be something, what would be something unexpected, something that people wouldn't expect about that process that you found to be interesting? The process. Not to put you on the spot, but what? <laughs> any, 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 any surprises or anecdotes about the innovation process? I think that the the sur the most surprising thing I find about the innovation process is um, uh, that people think innovation happens because oh, I create an innovation lab and I have people working on innovation. I think innovation happens in the context of solving customer problems, right? That's where the best kind of innovation actually happens, is when you're solving real customer problems. And then, but at the same time, giving uh, people who are innovators that freedom, right? To be able to solve the problem that they come up with, right? So there's a certain amount of iteration and sort of, you know, I call it, you have to walk down cul-de-sacs to figure out that you walk down a cul-de-sac to be able to walk back and then try again, right? And so uh, you want to you wanna allow for that, right? Okay. And so it's super iterative, um, you know, like generative AI, right? Like for the first generative AI paper, neural network paper was written in 1983, yeah. right? I was a sixth grader, <laughs> right? My memory of 1983 is India winning the World Cup for the first time in cricket, right? Like sixth grader, right? That's what I cared about. 40 years hence, right? Like it's taken that level of iteration it has taken our compute capabilities get to a certain level. You're a hardware guy, so you'll yeah. relate with this. How far we have come in terms of our compute capacity, you wouldn't have been able to imagine 40 years ago that, oh, we can have millions of computers with this level of parallel processing that we can run through neural networks where within seconds, right, we can give you a response and, right? So innovation just is that process, right? You, you want to allow for that. It'll go down cul-de-sacs and allowing for that to return. So I love that process, right? And, but staying focused on what you're trying to do for customers is where it will actually keep yielding for you. So what I take away from that is, it sounds like it's really important for your folks to have an innovation mindset on a daily basis. Absolutely. So when they arrive at the hack the sheet time of year, it's not that they're completely separating from what they're normally doing. It's a natural extension of it. So the mindset over the process sounds. Absolutely, and if you're in the software business, Dave, right? Yeah. Like, not innovating is like definition of death, death. right? Exactly. <laughs> well, no death here. <laughs> Just plenty of, uh, plenty of rain in Seattle making everything green, including the Engage conference here with Smartsheet. PG, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Dave Nicholson yeah. here, 6.5 Media on the road. Stay tuned for more.